Does it seem as though chaos envelops your world? Are you tired, longing for peace? Yahweh provides a way through His Scripture and provides helpful stepping stones on your path. Quiet Strength will introduce a strategy that can help. Wendy Klaus discusses creative ways to put goals into action, encourages stretching exercises to relieve tension, and helps you to apply them to your daily lifestyle. Join me as we uplift one another, learn new tactics, and bring Scripture into this chaotic world to help us find that quiet strength. And good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are doing well. My name is Wendy Larson, and this is Quiet Strength. And, um, I pray that wherever you are at, the, you have good weather. It is a beautiful day here at Yah Shalom up in the Bradshaw Mountains in Arizona. Absolutely beautiful up here today. And so I want to welcome you to Quiet Strength. If this is your first time, thank you so much for joining today. And um, today what we will um, talk about is the chapter four in the book of Ruth. We're going to finish up the book of Ruth. And then I'm going to share just a few things also. Um, Tuesday in the war prayer room, um, I had mentioned about a plant that uh, helps that's a, seen as a weed in our, um, in our yards. And when it is a plant that can help externally as well as internally. So I'm going to share just a few minutes of that as well. And if you're joining me on the YouTube channel through Quiet Strength and this is your first time visiting, come on over to MessianicLambRadio.com to our Lamb Video Network. And on there you'll get to see... Um, the programs that play throughout the day and you will love and just grow by listening to them. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. He, um, it's wonderful to um, watch and observe how his body, the body of Yeshua is different in so many ways, but we work for the same um, goal and direction, and that would be to Yahuwah, our Creator, Yeshua, our Savior. And so if you scroll down on the page, you'll get to see the uh, banner that is that shows all of the uh, highlights of books that have been written by some of our teachers, some of the family members of our teachers. There's children books. There's um, books on our relationship with Yahuwah, and you just don't want to miss these. And then if you scroll further down, um, you will see all of the broadcast schedules for the day and into the evening. And tonight, after um, Quiet Strength, we will have Join to Hashem. And then we have um, a rebroadcast of Monday, Let Us Reason Together. And then after that, we have uh, John Craig with the Uncensored News. So if you missed that on Monday, and I think John's also on Tuesday with Uncensored News, and you want to get in Uncensored News, come and join John this evening and listen in. And then um, something I thought about, if I go up further, maybe I will remember, and apparently not. But if I remember, I will make sure I come back to it. <laughs> All right. With that, I just kind of talked with you a little bit about our um, website here for Lamb Video Network. Also, we have a War Prayer Room. If you would like to come in and join us, the War Prayer Room begins at 830 
in the morning eastern time it's 5 30 my time here in arizona and um if you want to submit prayers just come on over to the top of the page you'll see submit prayers and if you click on that you the window will open for you to be able to type in your prayer requests and um, we will uh, be glad to pray for you and or pray for your family or friends uh, who go on the prayer list. It is a blessing to be a part of the prayer room. I always uh, afterwards leave just feeling refreshed. If you can come on to the site, you can come and join in the chat room. Feel encouraged because that is the best way to begin your day, isn't it? Yes. Amen. All right. With that, let's um, go ahead and move on. I'm going to just share a little bit. I have a picture here. Let me see what I did with it. And um, before I left Minnesota, I'm going to add this to the stream and see what happens. I took a little course called foraging and the the person who led this class it was just a, a very small class very quick lesson uh, had been a forest ranger for many many years and he took what he knew about plants and uh, he and his wife literally go out and they forage and bring in the plants so they know which plants out there are edible. Well, while we were talking, he introduced this plant and this plant is called a mullein. And if you look at it a little closer, you will see this mullein. You might recognize it as more of a smaller, it's going to have look like a rosette and the leaves are very furry and soft and um, we often call them weeds in our front yards and when I was learning about this plant I'm like goodness I wish I had known that because when I lived in Oklahoma um, I had a lot of these in my yard and I would have never put um, chemical on it and destroyed it and that's one of the things I get frustrated about because you know over the years years and years ago people knew about plants they learned about different plants that were edible that were poisonous and in the plants that were edible they used as medicine med medicines and as our world I should say uh, progressed, so to speak, we moved away from that and turned to taking medicine that um, inevitably takes part of what that plant is and what it does and put it in a capsule so that we can get better quicker. And I'm very thankful for that, but the they can't make money if they're just using the whole part of the plant because Yahuwah created the plant to, um, when it goes into our body, the parts that could affect another organ is covered by uh, another, um, oh, I don't know, DNA part of the plant. And so this is how it was explained to me by someone who was getting, she was about ready to take her, doc, her doctorate's test for being a naturopathic doctor. And, um, and so I'm just sitting there just listening to the, her speak and I'm going, wow, you know, so that's just something to think about. Um, I'm not going to say medication is wrong. Uh, I'm not going to say that. But I'm going to say that if we're taking it every single day to um, take care of an ailment, let's think twice about if something else goes wrong with talking with the physician about instead of giving us another medication and then another medication for that, and soon we're on, what, 6, 12 
15 parts of medications. Um, ask them, is there a medication that I can go on that will not affect this other organ? Just something like that. They, they you know, ask them to help you and hopefully they can. So back to the mullen. And so um, the mullen is, and I'm going to read it from this book here. I love it. The Herbal Apothecary. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> there you go. My green screen. And um, so the organs that this book says affects, the mullen affects, is the respiratory system. And it is a therapeutic um, action to it. And um, some of the medicinal parts to it is it's appropriate for a wide range of complaints of the upper and lower respiratory tract. Because it brings water into hardened, closed places, it is a good choice for dry and irritated tissues or when water is trapped in the lungs. It can soothe a tickly cough and can help lung cilia function properly if a cough is chronic. Mullion is also indicated for constriction or tightness in the lungs or throat, making it useful for treating asthma. So with knowing this information, it's educational. It's not saying going out and do it. Don't go and do anything without a doctor, back without a doctor, a uh, physician, okay? Um, but knowing about this, you might want to do a little bit more research and talk with someone who has a naturopathic background, who can help you with knowing what to do with the mullen that's in your yard, because this is what you can glean out of your yard. And it's, I would say free, but if you're paying for your house and land, it's yours, right? And see how you can use it. It um, relieves your ears for earaches. And here's something else that, um, is this the book that talks about it? There is that you can um, take the leaf of the mullen and chop it up and you can put it on a bruise or um trying to see if that's in this book i do have a forager book and i think that talks a little bit more of it um the ranger who i took the class from said that if you have a small break you can take the leaf and place it on your arm and leave it there and you know kind of replace it and put another one on off and on and there's something about that plant that heals it so I just wanted to share that with you. You might want to look more information about it, but the mullen is what is you can find in your yard. This picture apparently is about a two to three year old mullen. The first year they're really small. So I hope that helped you. I hope that was good information for you and that you can uh, use that to find out more, to uh, find more about and talk to a naturopathic, someone who is in naturopathy and uh, who can give you more advice and give you maybe some help and recipes on that. So, all right. So let's get started with the book of Ruth. And um, before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. And thank you so much for this opportunity to read scripture together to answer any questions father thank you for your word thank you so much that we can learn how your scripture is fulfilled and how we can grow and how we can place it upon our minds and we can walk in your promises. Father, thank you so much that when we read scripture, we are taking in Yeshua, our Hamashiach. 
and we are gleaning insight. Give us discernment, Father. Give us wisdom and understanding. But more, Father, give us the ability to take your words and live them out. Seeing and doing and acting. And living according to your word. And walking in your faith and faith in you. And Father, help us to encourage one another, lifting each other up. Walking in your peace, we ask this in the name of Yeshua Ahamashiach. Amen and amen. All right. So if you have your Bibles, if you could turn with me to... Um, all right. I did not. Okay. Be one moment, everyone. I apparently... I thought I had my slides up here, but... Apparently that didn't work. So one moment here while I pull them up and um, they come up. So while we're doing that, go ahead and turn to Ruth chapter uh, four. And we are going to talk a little bit about um, how this story, we're going to talk about the kinsman redeemer today. And there are some thoughts I kind of wrote down and I wanted to share with you. Maybe you can um, think about those things and do more research from it. Um, and also talk about um, character. Each time that I've we've read these, the chapter, even chapter one, two, and three, we've talked about the character, and that I feel like has been carried on through the book of Ruth, and I feel like that is something that the Lord has placed upon my heart. Sometimes I feel like, um, okay, here we go. Sometimes I feel like Spock, and, <laughs> and I say, you know, that does not compute. <laughs> I'm going to add this to the screen. There we go. Ah, and uh, there are some things that just do not compute to me. And regarding how people, the character of a person who says that they walk with the Lord. And, and it's only because scripture is clear that we strive and do our best to... Um, Seek the Lord with changing our heart. And changing our heart means changing uh, certain characteristics that can be changed. And um, certain things in our life that can be changed to separate us from the world. Because how do we live? We live a separate life, right? All right. With this, I wanted to share your picture. Yesterday, my dog started barking, and guess what was in our backyard? A bear. And we've been kind of seeing bears lately up here in the mountain. So I thought I'd show that a little bit with you on that. All right. And so... I'm just going to glean a little bit over chapter um, chapter end of chapter 2 and going into chapter 3. So what we learned last week from the end of chapter 2, we found out that Naomi finds out whose field that Ruth has been gleaning from, and she excitedly tells Ruth that, Wow, it's Boaz. He is our redeeming kinsman. And she was really excited. And then um, Naomi desired in her heart to seek someone for Ruth to have as a security. And she states that Boaz is her relative. And from this, she instructs Ruth to bathe, anoint herself and put on her best clothes, go to the threshing floor, not to make herself known to Boaz until he is finished eating and drinking, and note where he lies down, 
go and uncover his feet and lie down at his feet. And he will tell you what to do. Well, I found a site that gives a lot of more insight into this. And I thought uh, I might just kind of pull some of that out. It is from a commentary and it's called preceptaustin.org. And, um, and I'm going to bring some of this in just a little bit as um, we uh, talk about this part of Ruth. Because I wanted to kind of, I didn't talk too much about it, um, but... I want to kind of bring in what this author brings in. It's really neat. So if you want to take notes, it's really interesting information. And then we find that Ruth states that she's going to do what Naomi says to do. What trust that she has in Naomi, doesn't she? And this is her mother-in-law. Too many people don't have um, good relationships with their mother-in-laws, but apparently Ruth had a really good relationship, didn't she? Then we find out Ruth does everything that Naomi tells her. And to me, I thought of right away the Shema. That's why I have that there. The Shema. We say and we do, right? We um, In Deuteronomy, uh, we find that we are to talk diligently to our ch children regarding Yahuwah's instruction. We are to talk about them as we walk by the way, as we sit down, as we rise up, and as we lie down, right? That is every aspect of our life, isn't it? And so anyways, seems like Ruth does everything that Naomi says. She t puts her total trust in her mother-in-law. Then we find that Boaz... He ate and drank until his heart was merry. He lied down at the end of the grain pile. And Ruth goes over, uncovers his feet, and lies down. Boaz is startled at midnight and sees a woman at his feet. Now, let's talk a little bit about that. According to Austin uh, PreceptAustin.org, the author says, remain, the word remain, when he's talking about remain here for the night, I kind of got ahead of myself here. And when morning comes, if he will redeem, redeeming the Hebrew word is ga'al. They use the word goel. If, if the first redeemer will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. So remain. The word for remain in Hebrew is called lun, L-U-N. And this is a command which means to lodge and in modern Hebrew, the word for hotel derives from this verb. The same verb used was used by Ruth in Ruth 1.16, declaring where you lodge, I will lodge. Well, Boaz clearly would be disappointed if the nearest Goel redeemed Ruth. He nevertheless once again demonstrates his sterling character by saying, there's the word character, if he will redeem you, good. Most of us would not have said that word good, would they? I think Tov is good, right? But something else, even in expletive deleted, Boaz, however, is willing to accept the outcome. And then he goes on and says, notice that the phrase beginning with when the morning comes is another promise from Boaz, specifically declaring that he will resolve the issue the next day. And we talked a little bit last week about Boaz being a man of his word right? A person of their word will do what they say they will do, right? And then he, uh, the author goes back and says, um, redeem you. The words redeem you, gael or goel, occurs four times in this verse. In the NAS version, emphasizes especially the redemption is of Ruth. This association is obscured by the NIV version, um, the literal rendering 
for Ruth 3.13. And then he points out, and this is the part I wanted to say. I did mention this last week. I read a lot of different um, commentaries and ideas, and there are those who believe there was a type of a sexual encounter between Boaz and Ruth, and there are those who adamantly say no. He was a man of his character. He was known for not for his character, for who he was, for his strength. And so they say, no, he did not. And so I like what this talks about. The author says, Arnold uh, Fruchtenbaum makes the distinction regarding the verb remain that, quote, the word in Hebrew is lun and not shakav. And that is significant because Shekav does carry sexual connotations, but Lun does not. So, by the use of this verb, all ambiguity is removed concerning the sexual implication between the two. When they were in the very crucible of temptation, they proved themselves righteous by choosing integrity over passion. And... Um, he goes on and says the word morning, boker, means daybreak. Boker, B-O-Q-E-R, uh, means daybreak, the point of time at which night is changing to day, just before the rising of the sun. And in the ancient Near East, the night was divided into three watches. This might be some interesting information. The last period of the night was called the morning watch. This is found also in Exodus 14.24. And Exodus 14.24 says, At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. So this is the part that they consider the last period of the night called the morning watch. And then this and lasted from 2 o'clock a.m. to sunrise. So that's the time frame. When we read about the period of the judges, we learn that people did not travel the main highways because they were not safe. Instead, they would take off across the fields. So... Thinking about this, you know, I used to tell my children when they became teenagers and they got to the point where they were driving and I would say, OK, you're um, you have to be home by 10 o'clock. And I know a lot of parents are like, why? And I'm like and I would always tell my children, nothing good happens after 10 o'clock, maybe even after nine o'clock. There's a lot of mischievousness at night going on. So I tell my children, I want you home safe. And I want to know that you are safely here. I don't want you out and about. You are to be home. And they did. They honored that. And I was very thankful for that. I wasn't sure, especially when I first started saying this and my oldest was driving, I would say, you know, I can't sleep if you're not safe. And so I think that helped them to know and understand. So the traveling at night, I never saw being out past a certain time was safe. And so uh, that's good. I didn't realize that even back in the day that there was a certain amount of time where people did not travel because it wasn't a safe period of time. <laughs> so... But um, we also see that uh, Boaz, when he says remain here, he's not trying to take advantage of Ruth. And this is what, again, the author says. This truth about the danger of night travel helps us understand Boaz's charge for Ruth to remain the rest of the night. For in this way, she would be protected from any potential harm. And we see this protection again, because remember before this, in chapter two, we learn that Boaz looks at his workers and says, keep her. Or she, he says to Ruth, stay in our field, stay in this field, you can glean here. He's watching out for her protection. When a man 
is interested in a woman and he desires her for her husband, he is going to have that type of character about him. He is going to want to have that protection for this, his, for this woman, for this female. And uh, I'm afraid that too much of our society uh, teaches women to frown down upon that. And I can honestly tell you, it made me feel really good when um, it seemed that Kurt said, no, I don't want you to do this before we were married, knowing that it was for my protection. And so that meant a lot that said something about his character. And that says something about Boaz's character. He's looking out for her. And so what does the fact that he told Ruth there was another near kinsman redeemer show about Boaz's character? Well, as alluded to above, it shows that Christ the Christ-like, the Yeshua likes the unselfishness as well as honesty and humility. The humble person is not one who thinks meanly of himself. He simply does not think of himself at all. And that's uh, from Andrew Murray. Humility is that grace that when you know you have it, you have lost it. And, and I think I said last week something about when John, John says when his disciples comes to him and says, look, Yeshua, he's, his, his disciples are building, he's, his ministry is growing. And what were the words of John the Baptist? And those words have always stayed with me for so many years. He says, less of me, more of him. Oh, how we can have that spirit about us. Less of me. Father, help me. If I'm being selfish, show me so I can stop that behavior and become more like you. And that is something that we see also. Because Boaz says, you know, I've got to tell her there is someone in front of me. And if he wants her, I've got to step back. <laughs> and I'll have to not have her. What humbleness. He yields himself. The truly humble person knows himself and accepts himself. And they put it, he puts the verse Romans 12 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as Yahuwah has allotted to each a measure of faith. The author goes on. He yields himself to Yeshua to be a servant, to use what he is and has for the glory of Yahuwah and the good of others. He's not out to do it for himself. So when I go and do something, is it for me to better, to um, lift myself up, or is it for the betterment of other people? And those are things to keep in mind that we are servants of Yeshua and what we use and what we have should be for his glory. Years ago when I was kind of struggling with um, sticking with um, the getting back into the um, uh, being a full-time mom at home. I, I had worked for a little while and I decided to be home at mom or be a, a stay at home mom. And there was a book I was reading and it gave 
very much in sight where when we clean every single day and our kids are constantly throwing their stuff everywhere <laughs> and our spouse and we're constantly cleaning up after them and we start getting into that complaining mode. I, I don't think you've ever been there, have you? <laughs> but there is something that was I, either I read in a book or I was told by a wonderful, wonderful, godly woman. When you clean, do it for the glory of God. Don't do it to for your husband or for your kids. Do it for the glory of God. And so as I was starting to put my management into organized ways of cleaning, um, I began saying, Father, help me to do this unto you and not unto myself to look really good in my children's or husband's eyes. And then my view of cleaning got better and I could look and see, have I done it to my best of my ability? Father, are you happy with what I've done? And so that was a growth period. And so for anyone out there who um, is struggling with cleaning all the time and just tired of doing whatever task it is that you're doing, Maybe change your mindset and say to yourself, Father, or say to your our Heavenly Father, Father, may you be glorified by what I do. And that's going to change how you think and what you do and how you do it. Because if you want to do your best for Yahuwah, you're going to do your best. And um, he will honor you for that. So with that, I just kind of got off on a little tangent here. Sorry about that. All right, let's look at chapter four. Um, oh, I, I got ahead of myself and I already went over that. So let's go on to the next slide. Here we go. Chapter four. Here we go. Meanwhile, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there and all of a sudden, the Goel, about whom Boaz had spoken, passed by. Come over, he called, and sit down here, my friend. So he came over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten of the town's elders and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Goel, Naomi, who has returned from the region of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belongs to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you, say, buy it in the presence of the people sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, redeem it. But if it will not be redeemed, then tell me so that I can know because there is no one else in line to redeem it. I am after you. I will redeem it, he said. And um, then Boaz said, Then one day, on the day you buy the field from Naomi's hand, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased over his inheritance. The kinsman said, Then I cannot redeem it for myself, or else I might endanger my own inheritance. You take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now in the past in Israel, one removed his sandal and gave it to another in order to finalize the redemption and transfer of, it, of a matter. This was a legal transaction in Israel. So the kinsman said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. Then he took off his shoe. Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have bought from Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Mechalon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mechalon, 
to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased over his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the gate of his town. You are witnesses today. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he went to her, Adonai enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Adonai, who has not left you without a go well today. May his name be famous throughout Israel. Moreover, he will be to you a renewer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Naomi took the child and held it to her bosom and took care of him. The neighboring women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they called him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. These are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amminadab. Amminadab fathered Nashan. Nashan fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. All right, so let's kind of ask some questions here. One stood out to me is what is a goel? Well, I looked up the definition of goel, and um, the according to um, Strong's definition, it meant um, oh no, I don't have it in my mind. <laughs> We didn't have the same meaning of what uh, we have here. And so I began scratching my head going, okay, why is go well meaning this word when in scripture it means, um, oh, there it is, defilement or defiling. That it was according to Strong's. Uh, Hebrew dictionary and I didn't understand it because I know that's not what it means in these in the verses and in the word goel you have the gimel you have the aleph and you have the lamed and those are the letters of the word gaal and so how is gaal similar to goel well according again to PreceptAustin.org. The main word is the verb ga'al. Ga goel is the active participle of the verb ga'al and conveys a primary sense of being restored to an original state. A goel, therefore, was one who not only delivered, but one who effected restoration to an original state. The goel is to do the part of a kinsman and thus to redeem their kin from difficulty or danger by the payment of a price. Goel, the active participle from form of gael, has practically become a noun in its own right. Thus, goel is translated as a noun with the words as redeemer, kinsman, or avenger. And that's the reason why they have the word goel and not Gael in the translation. So don't be confused, he says, if you are looking up the Strong's numbers, because Strong did not assign a separate number to the root verb Gael and the active participle Goel, although for reasons unclear to me, he did assign a separate, me being the author, <laughs> he did assign a separate number for Gaula, which is the passive participle of ga'al. So ga'al is the root verb form. The active participle is go'el. 
and this is usually translated as the kinsman, redeemer, and avenger. So as I was reading the scripture, some kind of thoughts came into mind, and I am not sure if these are right thoughts or not, but I wanted to share them with you. And I thought to myself, what if the Redeemer in Boaz's story could be related in some way to maybe Adam being the first Redeemer, right? And so I started thinking about things, and this is what I kind of came up with. So for Adam, Adam inherited the garden. He was the first one. He's the first in line and to receive the inheritance, which was the garden. And he was created by Yahuwah. And we also see the first redeemer in Boaz's story. He's the first one to be able to redeem uh, Naomi's inheritance, to receive this inheritance, right? And then the next thought was, okay, because of sin, he could not keep this inheritance for Adam, going back to Adam here. He was actually sent out, and he could not keep that inheritance. In a way, he gave it up. In the same way, the first Redeemer in Boaz's story gave up the inheritance of Naomi due to it endangering his own inheritance because Ruth was part of that. How many in Israel gave up inheritance due to their, you know, not wanting Gentiles coming in? I don't know. Just the thought there. And, of course, we hear the stories about how Boaz is a type, type of Yeshua. And I have here seven ways Boaz is a type of Yeshua. And this is from dailyhisdisciple.com. And he says, the author states, Boaz was from Bethlehem and Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. We brought that up in chapter one, didn't we? He says Boaz is a type of Yeshua because he's a godly character and grace-filled compassion. Boaz notices Ruth. He talks to her, tells her to abide in his field with his maidens, and shows her grace. This reminds us about how Yeshua talks to us. He talked to us, right? He talked to his disciples. We read that in the, in the Gospels. And he encourages his disciples, he encourages those who come to him to abide in him. And like Boaz, Yeshua has pity on us. He calls out to us, bringing us into his field to labor alongside of his workers, and he gives grace. Boaz provides for Ruth like Yeshua provides for us. Yahuwah provides for us. Similarly, Jesus, Yeshua fed people physically and spiritually. Boaz fed Ruth and Naomi, didn't he? We see that Boaz is seen as a mighty man, mighty man of wealth. And we know that Yeshua has his kingdom he's going to be bringing, right? And he is mighty. We see that Boaz is a gentleman. We talked about that. And he didn't force himself on Ruth. He was a man who, who um, gently talked to her, didn't he? And we see that the same with Yeshua, doesn't, don't we? He, does, he never forces himself on people. Yahuwah does not force himself on others, on us, does he? We come to him. We're drawn to him, right? And then we find that Boaz sends Ruth away with six measures of barley as a sign of his promise to marry her. Yeshua has given us the Holy Spirit to help us, protect us, and to teach us. And it is a sign, isn't it, that one day he's going to return and he's coming for his bride. And we see also how Boaz took Ruth 
as his bride. We see how we're all grafted in. We're grafted in, as Paul says, into, um, oh, i got to find that verse. I'll have to find it and share it. <laughs> I'm watching the time as well. Or else I'd look it up. But um, we're grafted in. And how much more uh, should we be humble because of that, right? Humbly uh, being grafted in. Some things that I um, wanted to point out here that the, again, author of this commentary shows. I thought this was pretty neat. He sees that, uh, he shows that Naomi is a bereaved with her loved ones in chapter one, and Ruth chooses to follow Naomi. In chapter two and three, we see how Naomi helps Ruth, and Ruth seeks the field to glean in. And Boaz sees her and loves her. And then in chapter four, we see Naomi rejoicing over Obed, and Ruth receiving Boaz, and Boaz marries her. What a wonderful picture that we see from the book of Ruth. And then also, uh, just a little bit more extents of what just, I did more of a general. May I share with you something my son Patrick is... Um, attends a congregation in Clarksville, Tennessee, and he has been asked off sometimes to give um, his understanding of the Torah portion. And if I could just share, I thought what he shared, I'd like to share with you. Patrick states in his uh, learning from the Torah, my attention was drawn to two specific passages within the readings for this week. First is Numbers 12, verses 4 through 8, which states, And the Lord suddenly said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, You three go out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had come in, forward he said now hear my words if there is a prophet among you i the lord will make myself known to him in a vision i will speak with him in a dream it is not this way for his for my servant moses he is faithful in all my household with him i speak mouth to mouth that is openly and not using riddles and he beholds the form of the lord so why were you not afraid to speak against my servant against Moses. And the second is Zechariah 3, verses 6 through 7, which states, And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, The Lord of hosts says this, If you walk in my ways and if you keep my command, then you will both govern my house and be in charge of my courtyards, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. Patrick states, Looking at Moses' relationship with Yahweh, I asked myself, what did Moses do to be on such a level with the Father that he spoke with him so plainly? And what did God mean when he said that Moses is faithful in all my household? Well, to be faithful means to be loyal, and to be loyal means to support and stand behind someone who, or some ideology. And that's what Moses did. He did what he was called to do, lived as he was instructed to live, and led Israel to do the same. It was through walking in his ways, his commands, that Moses was able to have such a close relationship with Yahweh. Now, jumping to Zechariah, we see Yahweh say, If you walk in my ways and if you will keep my command, then you will both govern my house and be in charge of my courtyards. One Again, one can see that a close relationship with Yahweh is formed through walking in his ways and keeping his word. So what does this mean for us? 
It means that we should likewise strive to walk in his ways, not for the purpose of gaining power or authority, but for the purpose of becoming closer to God. Power and authority was never Moses' end goal. That wasn't even the driving force behind him leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Those things were given to him because he chose to pursue the one who called him. He walked in the ways set before him by Yahweh. And that relationship with God was the reason, the driving force behind him. And likewise, it should be the driving force behind us. I see some words he chose, and I see the words humble, and I see the word character. These are some words that we talked about in all four chapters and we discussed today. It is not, it is not us. It is Yahuwah whom we should be following and who should be our driving force behind us. And we should be putting him before us and not us above anything else. As a reminder, foremost, start your day with prayer and in scripture. Walking in that scripture as we've learned today. Choosing to follow Yahuwah and walk in his ways. For this should be our driving force behind us, and we will have that quiet spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May you be encouraged, and I pray that some of these things that we talked about today are things that you can grow and think about Go back in scripture, learn more about, and seek the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shalom alaikum, everyone. May you have a blessed day. Does it seem as though chaos envelops your world? Are you tired, longing for peace? Yahweh provides a way through His Scripture and provides helpful stepping stones on your path. Quiet Strength will introduce a strategy that can help. Wendy Klaus discusses creative ways to put goals into action, encourages stretching exercises to relieve tension, and helps you to apply them to your daily lifestyle. Join me as we uplift one another, learn new tactics, and bring scripture into this chaotic world to help us find that quiet strength. richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest, most diverse, yet up-to-date progressive teachings, discussion, and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet. Be sure to take the tour of the MessianicLambRadio.com website. I'm Susan Hoogie, thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network.